Hi, this is Emma, and welcome to Esoteric Detective. Recently world-renowned theoretical physicist, Dr. Majio Kuku, sat down for an interview with world-renowned artificial intelligence Dr. Ray Kurzweil, who is at the forefront of artificial intelligence and robotics. The two geniuses, talked about how soon computer intelligence will soon surpass us and the possible outcomes of this. This took place in a June 7th interview on Dr. Michio Kaku's radio program. Explorations. A link to the full program shall be placed in the description. Let's take a look. Very soon machines will begin to approach human intelligence and perhaps even exceed human intelligence. And even worse than this for humans, robots will be able to create copies of themselves that are even more intelligent than they are. And so they'll be able to bootstrap themselves to become arbitrarily intelligent, in which case they may begin to leave the Earth and begin to colonize the galaxy. That is called the singularity, the point at which we have runaway machines creating machines of even higher intelligence, and the whole process just keeps on going until they, well, take over the universe. Sounds like science fiction? Well, yeah, but it's a position that can't be ruled out. So once again, our special guest in the second half of exploration is inventor Ray Kurzweil, and we are talking about, well, what happens when the computer revolution goes amok? Mr. Kurzweil, the first question for you is, how did you first get interested in robots and artificial intelligence? Uh, I've actually had in mind being an inventor since I was at the age of five. And age of 12, I discovered computers. I built some primitive computers myself and got access to one uh, as part of a summer job and quickly became fascinated with the ability to kind of model the world, albeit primitively at that time, in the computer and create virtual realities, uh, and also model our thinking processes. Quickly became uh, interested actually in pattern recognition, which is my view is, is the fundamental basis of human intelligence rather than logical sequential analytical thinking. And a uh, project I did in high school was to build pattern kind of recognition models of melodies and I would feed in the melodies of Mozart or Chopin and they would build a pattern recognition model and then write original melodies in the same style from that model uh, which were recognizable kind of sounded like second rate uh, compositions from a second rate student of Chopin and Mozart uh, and that started really a lifelong fascination in pattern recognition which is really my primary technical field we will have machines uh, which is to say non-biological entities that do have the complexity and richness and depth of the human brain, indeed modeled on the principles of operation of the human brain within a few decades. And when these entities claim to be conscious, to be joyful, fearful, angry, uh, and so on, unlike, let's say, the computer characters in, in video games today, those entities, a few decades from now, will be as convincing as humans. They'll have all the subtle emotional cues that we associate with somebody really having those subjective experiences. So are they conscious? Some philosophers, philosophers will say no. They're not squirting human neurotransmitters. You can't be conscious if you're not biological. Uh, but there won't be any clear distinction. We won't be able to separate them from any kind of objective observation. And my prediction, and this is really not a philosophical statement, but a psychological and political prediction, is that the bulk of humans, unenhanced humans, will consider these non-biological entities to be conscious. In any event, they'll be very intelligent to be able to convince us that they're conscious, and they'll get angry at us if, if we don't believe them. Uh, and it'll be an actual political and, and legal issue as well. Uh, in my view, the, the real issue of consciousness is not something we can resolve scientifically because science involves third-party objective observation. Consciousness is inherently first-party subjective experience, and there is a gap there. Some people go on to say, well, since it's not scientific, it's not an important question. 
I would turn that around and say it's really a very fundamental question. It shows that there is a need for philosophy outside of science. Uh, but these will become real compelling questions as opposed to just abstract philosophical debates in this 21st century. Uh, if you follow all the exponential trends in computation, communication, brain scanning, exponentially growing knowledge of the human brain, it's, I think, conservative to say we will have reverse engineered the principles of operation of the human brain within a quarter century. So how smart are our robots? Uh, are our robots really so dumb that they are really insect level at the present time, barely able to understand chairs, uh, tables, the ceiling, the roof, uh, people maneuvering around the room? How smart are the robots today? Just ultimately, I believe within uh, less than three decades, by 2029, uh, these machines will be operating at human levels and will combine human levels of intelligence, the subtlety and suppleness of human pattern recognition with some of the natural advantages of machines, most notable of which is the ability to instantly share knowledge. Now let's talk a little bit about Moore's Law, the doubling time you mentioned of 18 months for computers, meaning that at Christmas time, your computers are almost twice as powerful as they were the previous Christmas. Uh, exponential growth in bacteria, for example, eventually seals off, otherwise bacteria would take over the entire planet Earth, and exponential uh, factors do taper off because of external effects. Now with Moore's Law and computers, uh, the engine driving Moore's Law is ultraviolet uh, etching technology by which we can etch tinier and tinier transistors on a silicon wafer the size of your thumb. But eventually the transistors get so tiny, you hit the quantum theory. And at that point, you get short circuits. Leakage takes place. All hell breaks loose. And by 2020, um, all bets are off. Uh, the Intel, one of the senior engineers at Intel, uh, admitted recently in a, in a major paper that yes, they can see the end of the, the end of the tunnel. And that is at a certain point, it's going to be prohibitively difficult to, to etch silicon components that are tinier and tinier and eventually get leakage because you don't know where the electrons are. Some people have said, let's make three-dimensional cubes. But the problem there is you have heat generation, enormous quantities of heat generated in three-dimensional cubes. So the question is, what happens after 2020 when all hell breaks loose and Silicon Valley becomes a rust belt? Well, it's a key question. And to examine that, uh, I've done a number of things. Uh, I have been an ardent student of technology trends. I've been uh, <coughs> measuring the actual power of different technologies <laughs> for 25 years. I have a team of people doing that. One thing I did is put 49 uh, famous computers over the last century, uh, long before there was a Moore's Law, on an exponential chart. And this exponential growth has been going on not just for Moore's Law, but back uh, through five different paradigms. Moore's Law, the shrinking of transistors on a flat integrated circuit, is, is not the first, but the fifth paradigm to provide exponential growth to computing. And every time one paradigm ran out of steam, because as, as you correctly point out, every method of exponential growth eventually runs out of capacity. Rabbits in Australia eat up the vegetation and stop growing exponentially, they even reverse direction. Uh, every time that happened, another paradigm came along and started another S-curve of exponential growth uh, they were shrinking vacuum tubes to make, to continue exponential growth. Finally, they couldn't shrink them anymore and keep the vacuum. That paradigm ended. Transistors came along. And the next paradigm will be three-dimensional computing. We live in a three-dimensional world. Our brain's organized in three dimensions. Our brain, by the way, uses a very cumbersome, very slow, uh, informa electrochemical information processing method, uh, that 200 calculations per second. They're digitally controlled analog transactions, but they're roughly comparable to, to calculations. Uh, at least 10 million times slower than electronic circuits, but it gets a tremendous power from the fact that it's organized in three dimensions. Now, the brain itself is an existence group of so the feasibility of organizing circuits in three dimensions uh, and dealing with the heat problem. Uh, I propose three-dimensional computing at the sixth paradigm to place Moore's Law, which was the fifth paradigm in my book, The Age of Spiritual Machines, four years ago, 
It was considered a radical notion then. I would say it's much more of a mainstream uh, expectation at this time. There's been tremendous progress in building, working three-dimensional circuits over the last four years. There's been a steady flow of breakthroughs, including conceptual examinations of this thermal issue that you alluded to. And there are ways of designing the circuits in, in porous ways to deal uh, with the with the heat issue. Uh, one watt of power, which would not generate uh, that much heat, uh, would be sufficient to emulate human brain capacity uh, in a cube that would be very tiny. Uh, so the thermal issue is, in fact, a key challenge, but uh, there's, there's a lot of confidence that that's feasible. And uh, we still have at least a dozen years to go. And what we've seen typically is when the, when the end, end is in sight for a particular paradigm, it creates tremendous pressure in the R&D community to create the next paradigm. And we have a lot of advanced warning this time. Uh, and already, in fact, uh, just using conventional lithography and going to the third dimension, because after all, even conventional circuits have 14 or 15 layers of material, so they do have some three-dimensional capacity. And uh, there's been successful efforts to build circuits with dozens and even up to 100 layers of, of circuitry just using conventional techniques. Uh, there are many different approaches. Uh, the most effective appears to be carbon nanotubes, which is what I had predicted uh, in my book four years ago. Okay. Well, the heat problem, as you mentioned, is quite fierce. Uh, engineers tell me that uh, very soon even cubicle computers will generate so much heat you can fry an egg on them. Uh, let me ask you a question about the top up uh, the, the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach. Uh, when we had uh, Rodney Brooks on the radio, uh, he said that there are two approaches to artificial intelligence, top-down and bottom-up. Uh, the top-down approach has dominated AI research for the last uh, several decades, and the goal there is to have a CD-ROM with all the laws of common sense, all the laws of logic on it. You simply put the CD-ROM in a computer, and all of a sudden your computer says, I think, I am aware. I am conscious, okay, I'm alive. That's a top-down approach which failed rather miserably. Uh, we know that there are hundreds of millions of lines of common sense. Uh, we, we, we can't put them on a CD-ROM. There's so many of them. The other one is a bottom-up approach which follows nature, mother nature, uh, allowing uh, machines to learn like bugs, uh, like infants, uh, to bump into the environment. And that approach is like a neural network approach. So could you explain to us a little bit about neural network theory? Uh, and this, of course, means that our brain, in some sense, is not really a digital computer at all. That perhaps we were sort of misled over the last 50 years in terms of the successes of silicon. But the brain is really a neural network and not really a Turing machine at all. Could you elaborate? Well, I've always been a strong advocate of what you're referring to as the bottom-up approach. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the brain, uh, the design of it, characterized by only about 12 million bytes of compressed information in the genome. You might wonder, how could that be when the brain itself contains millions of times more information than that? Uh, and the way it works is the genome specifies a particular design, but in a particular region, the actual wiring of the connection is uh, random within certain constraints. And we know that that's the case, uh, having watched how that process unfolds. Uh, then there's actually kind of an evolutionary process where the connections that make the most sense in the environment survive. And it's actually twice as many connections in the newborn baby's brain as it exists a year later. Uh, there's a lot of self-organization. Self and the brain it has the capacity to interact with its environment, make sense of, its, of the environment, as well as make sense of its own design and its own interconnections actually continually being repruned and uh, reconnected to to make sense of the environment and to learn. And that is really the only approach that's going to work. Uh, I mean, I think the psych project, Doug Lamad, is, is interesting. It's accomplished a lot, but I never felt that we could build human-level intelligence that way. We really have to build it the way nature builds it, which is a machine that has the capacity to learn, and then provide for its, its education. Now, neural nets is sort of one uh, attempt based on a crude model of how human neurons work, uh, which actually 
builds lots of neuron simulators and connects them somewhat the way the brain connects them and lets them self-organize. And there's, there's a number of different approaches to neural nets. Uh, they're all uh, very simplified from what we now know uh, is true of actual neurons. And as we're uh, as progress in reverse engineering the human brain progresses and we have more sophisticated and realistic models of actual neurons, we can build more realistic, biologically inspired paradigms. But in general, pattern recognition, which is my field, uh, works by emulating nature in the self-organizing methods. We set up some approach, which could be a neural net, uh, this thing called Markov models, which is the mathematical cousin of neural nets. There are evolutionary algorithms that actually emulate evolution. And actually part of human learning has a kind of an evolutionary process take place inside the brain for the better connections that survive. Uh, we use these techniques uh, in our pattern recognition approach. We'll actually stimulate evolution, have different solutions to a problem, compete with each other through thousands of generations of simulated evolution. And these biologically inspired methods are very powerful. They give results that are essentially unpredictable just as so human decision making is unpredictable without actually letting it unfold uh, and this is really the approach that ha will work uh, trying to define as analytic uh, logical rules every bit of common sense uh, it's not going to work it's too complex too unwieldy and it's not how human intelligence works